Good afternoon, everyone from the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. My name is Alexandra Kuzmanovic, and I work in the Department of Communications. We are two days ahead of the World Health Assembly, the first ever virtual World Health Assembly to take place. As we are under extraordinary circumstances of COVID-19 pandemic this year, this decision-making body will meet virtually to discuss organization's priorities. It is my great pleasure to have a special guest today to talk about this first ever virtual World Health Assembly, professor and the chair of Global Public Health um, at the University of Edinburgh, Devi Sridhar. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us, Devi. Thank you for having me. Um, you, you have a great experience in um, researching effectiveness of public health interventions, also uh, developmental assistance for health, and you co-authored a book on governing global health. So I would like to hear your opinion about uh, what people are saying that this may be the most important ever World Health Assembly. What is your opinion? Do you agree and, and, and why? I think that's very true. I mean, this pandemic is probably the most significant event in people's lives. I mean, the parallels are to the 1918 um, flu pandemic, and we need cooperation at a level that we haven't seen for, for many, many years. Um, three particular issues are pressing right now. The first is that the usual donor countries in Europe, in the States, and Scandinavia are consumed internally with their own battle against COVID. And so who's looking out for low and middle income countries, figuring out what kind of support they need? Here, it's very important that WHO and the WHA have a role to, to play in this. The second one is actually about the role of science. Science is the true exit strategy. And so who's actually creating a blueprint? How are we supporting that? How do we actually think this through? And the last thing is actually that other health agendas don't go away just because we have COVID. One of the things we've learned from outbreaks is they can become black holes. And so all attention, all resource becomes consumed by addressing one virus and the resulting disease. So actually WHO has an important role to make sure that other issues are also discussed that are on the agenda, such as polio eradication, malaria, HIV, TB, as well as the basic building blocks of primary health care. So thank you, Debbie. Would you, would you elaborate a little bit more? What are the urgent, urgent issues that member states should discuss next week when, when they meet virtually? As we have this year, very sorry, we have very short World Health Assembly this year, only two days in comparison to a week in uh, traditionally. So I think there's three core things related to COVID itself. The first is for countries to report on the progress they've made and share any learnings they've had already on how to actually tackle this virus, the policy measures that you can undertake and the role of government itself. I think the second is actually what do cover countries require in terms of support? Where are the gaps? in terms of, is it, is it financial gaps? Are they technical gaps? Is it actually equipment? What do countries actually need? How do we identify those gaps so that we can start to figure out how we're gonna fill them? For example, the role of the World Bank in filling some of those financial gaps. And the third is actually continuing the work the WHO has done on research and development, R&D. To actually set forward a roadmap and plans for therapeutics, um, diagnostics, as well as hopefully um, a possible vaccine in the near future. Thank you, thank you, Devi. What do you think, based on your research and experience and a loud voice that we see on social media, what do you think is WHO's role in the world? Well, WHO was created for exactly these kind of events. If we take, take the origins all the way back, even pre-World War II, they go back to 1851, when the International Sanitary Conventions were agreed upon, when states realized that actually it was in their own interest, their national interest, to work cooperatively across the world to find solutions to infectious disease outbreaks. And so we need this institution more than ever before. It's a normative technical agency which offers best practice, which tries to be an independent, neutral fora for states to come together to discuss very challenging health issues, set priorities, agree on a budget for these, and actually move forward. And so I think people sometimes overestimate what the agency can do in the sense that they say, oh, is it operational or is it finance or is it, you know, is it enforcer? And it's none of those things. This is a normative um, and, and technical agency that actually supports member states, which actually lead and dictate its core work um, to, to, to enable, you know, in its mandate, the, the best health for the world. 
Thank you, Devi. Um, we are already receiving some questions from our viewers, and um, please, if you have more, leave them in uh, via comment section on Facebook and LinkedIn, or reply on our Twitter thread um, on Twitter. So the first question is coming, and maybe you as a professor could uh, explain this. What are building blocks of healthcare? Well, building blocks of healthcare come back to actually primary healthcare services. So actually, how do people access their healthcare? Is it free? Is it accessible? And um, what kind of packages, insurance packages do you offer people? We can't forget about the people. Actually, human resources for health are an essential component. Um, and so it's basically when you start with healthcare, you start to look at how do we make sure that every single person has access to healthcare when they need it, that it's affordable, accessible, and equitable. Thank you, Devi. And while we are waiting for more questions, would you tell us, in your opinion, what is WHO's role in, in um, emergency responses? Our mission is to promote health, but also to keep the world safe and serve the vulnerable. So how do you see our role in, in, in this regard? Well, WHO has unique legal ability, and it's agreed something called the International Health Regulations. These are actually the legal guidance for how states can report if they have an outbreak within their boundary uh, within their borders and actually um, notifying WHO who can then go and alert other member states and then it can oversee this, surveil it, sur offer surveillance, offer sharing of information um, and actually you know, get the process going so that different countries can learn about this and move quickly to develop their own responses. The key mechanism here is the emergency committee. So if we think that China notified the WHO about a novel pathogen, this was 31st of December, WHO started letting member states know very soon after that. And so in a sense, the clock started for countries to prepare or not to prepare at that point. The next important step, which was less than a month later, was when the emergency committee met um, twice actually to decide, is this a public health emergency of international concern? This is the highest designation we have at an international level to alert to actually an emergency. That means that there is concern about a novel um, situation that could affect countries all across the world. It's the alarm bell we have. That was wrong on January 30th. And so I think, you know, there's been some confusion about the term pandemic and that, you know, was WHO too late in March to use this term? And actually, the, the pandemic term is meaningless in terms of operationally. The key moment was January 30th when this was declared a public health emergency. Um, the next important step I would go to is actually in February when China was able um, to give access to the WHO and an international mission to go in and there was a resulting report and press conference by the WHO sharing what they had learned from China and I think that was incredibly useful to learn a bit about the characteristics of this virus, um, how the disease had spread, some of the epi characteristics of it, as well as finally the policy response the Chinese government had undertaken, which could provide some lessons or some guidance to other countries on what had already been done as they tried to create their own responses based on their domestic situation. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much. I'm glad you mentioned international health regulations. That's um, a mechanism that um, also um, enables WHO to work with all countries. And in this response as well, we are supporting both developing and developed countries. Do you see any um, con contrast in, in responses that we see in, in different countries? Um, definitely. I think what's been fascinating and sometimes horrifying to see across countries is that there's generally the same scientific knowledge about this virus because it's being shared so um, so rapidly. And so the scientific knowledge is not really British science or English science or Chinese science. This is just science. And in this, you know, taking the science, taking the advice of WHO and what they're trying to guide towards in, in, in their documents and, and press conferences, different countries have responded in different ways. And my sense, and again, I haven't actually done a, a thorough analysis yet of this, is that the countries that followed very closely its WHO advice that actually undertook rapid containment, you know, test trace, isolate, you know, basically took the lessons from you know South Korea and early East Asian countries that moved fast and rapidly responded and seemingly effectively responded have done better. Um, countries in Eastern Europe as well. Um, I think the countries that kind of thought they knew better perhaps or didn't listen as well, um, thinking of countries in Europe, the UK, the United States, had struggled more because WHO actually, the emergency team has considerable 
expertise. If you look at the people at the top of the health emergencies program, at the top of, you know, um, you know, outbreak response, these are people who've been working in this area for decades on exactly this. And so it's wise to actually take advantage of that knowledge and that resource base rather than trying for every country to reinvent the wheel for, for what to do. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you for explaining this this response as well very well. Um, we are getting more questions, and this one comes from YouTube. Um, the person is also applauding the sci scientists who are working on this outbreak and asking what we can expect from the World Health Assembly. What do you think will, will be the outcome? Well, first, I'll hope that there'll be a putting aside of geopolitical hostilities and a recognition that we actually have to support the science I think two parts of that. One is actually putting aside all the sea of, of the noise of misinformation. There's a lot of misinformation going about, and we need a clearinghouse for good information. So I think if we can come out, hopefully, with a, a resolution that talks about the role of WHO in knowledge production, in being a kind of arbiter of the information and what's accurate, what's not accurate, that would be fantastic. Um, I think the second part of that is actually drawing on the R&D blueprint that was already created earlier on to take it further and actually say, this is what the knowledge is around therapeutics, this is what the knowledge is around diagnostics, this is what we're learning so far about vaccines. Because what's gonna become incredibly important in the coming months is of the dozens and dozens of vaccine candidates to identify quite quickly which are the two to three that are the most important, most viable, uh, most promising. How do we actually get the financing behind them and potentially even start the manufacturing of large doses of them even before trials are done? So these are the kind of things I think science is probably going to have a very essential point in this because it's ultimately going to be probably the best, you know, the best way out of this situation for all countries. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, since this outbreak started, our experts were advising countries um, to have a comprehensive package of interventions to stop the virus. Um, what are the merits of, of those comprehensive measures, in your opinion, versus lockdowns and, and other measures that countries are taking? Yeah, so lockdowns have been used increasingly as a way to combat this virus, but they're not a solution in the sense that they actually don't make the virus go away. They suppress the virus, but they're not sustainable. It's a very crude and short-term policy instrument you can use while you try to build your public health infrastructure, get your package of interventions ready to go, and then you can release the lockdown knowing that you have some safety net in terms of other interventions that can suppress the virus. And so I think that's been exactly right. That, you know, the core package of interventions we're now seeing revolve around, you know, a test, trace, isolate, you know, um, support strategy where you actually um, are aggressively going after the virus. I mean, as, as Dr. Tedros has been saying, you know, test, test, test. You have to know where the virus is, otherwise you're flying blind. Also what revolves around real-time data systems and surveillance to rapidly identify clusters of cases Added to that, you know, paying attention to where this virus transmits very easily. This is around hospitals and care homes, prisons, basically indoor facilities where you have many people close together and often vulnerable people. Um, another one is actually looking at, you know, trying to this go towards some kind of new normal in the sense of having people work from home if they can, rethinking workspaces, um, mask using masks as needed, especially on public transport or during, you know, um, you being in shops or crowded facilities. And so I think this is where, you know, a lot of countries are now arriving at, which is how do we get that package, which means we can lift lockdowns because these are not sustainable for economic reasons, um, for, for social reasons. And we don't want the, you know, lockdowns to create more suffering and more death than the virus itself. Thank you, Debbie. Um, what do you, um, looking forward, um, after one day we, we are out of this pandemic, um, what are the lessons that we need to take from, from this experience and be ready for future to, to keep the world safe? So I think there's, I'll say kind of three lessons that I hope in some sense will come away with this. The first is actually that our health challenges are interconnected. So what is happening in a remote part of a country somewhere else across the globe might feel very far away, but given we have planes and bugs travel far and fast, um, especially respiratory um, pathogens, but just to be aware of how closely our world is intertwined, even though it may not feel like that sometimes. I think the second one is about overreacting or reacting early. Um, I think there was a lot of fear about, oh, no, we're going to make a bigger deal of this and people being accused of spreading panic or creating fear. It's always better to overreact, 
you know, prevent something from happening. And then later on, if people blame you saying, oh, you overreacted, it wasn't a big deal, it means actually your prevention worked. You stopped something from happening. So I think all the incentives should be to be more alarmed and less alarmed. Um, I think the third one is about the role of essential workers and scientists and health workers, um, often the basic building blocks of societies, people like cleaners, delivery drivers, um, people who pick up rubbish, um, you know, nurses, doctors, journalists, um, scientists, these kind of essential roles are forgotten and undervalued. And I hope that, you know, people around the world will realize actually how important these types of jobs and careers are for, um, you know, for a successful society. Uh, how would, how do you think we can ensure that actually we are ready for for the next situation as such and a next disease outbreak because we know that many people and including our leadership and Dr. Tedros were warning the world for a long time that it's it's not a question whether the pandemic will happen one day but it's just a question of time when it will happen and the world was warned but we we were not ready in this time so how we can ensure in future that we are ready in your opinion yeah, that's a great question. I think it is frustrating for those of us who have been working in this field, the cycles of panic and neglect. You know, you have mass panic around, I think back, you know, there was Zika virus, and then before that it was Ebola, and then you had the various, you know, swine flu and avian flu. It just feels like, you know, there's this lurch about how important this is, and then it disappears as soon as the crisis is over. So it's, I think, you know, about creating... Um, you know, structures that mean between crises that actually capacities are being built up and preparedness is put in place, that actually there are robust plans within countries and investment in those plans and actually how would you deal with a future crisis? Because actually this, this hopefully is the only one for most people to this scale, but it may not be. There are probably going to be other viruses emerging um, or drug-resistant bacterial infections um, or pandemic flu of some kind. And so I think we have to be learning from this to put in place the structures, the systems, the governance, the financing, stuff that doesn't capture you know, uh, headlines, it's painstaking, it's detailed, can often be seen as boring, but we're seeing it's absolutely essential. The things that grab headlines um, don't necessarily, is not necessarily what needs to drive the work in between outbreaks. It's all the preparatory stuff that needs to be done. Thank you, Devi. Um, you mentioned earlier as well, some people are spreading panic. And we know that this outbreak was also, um, it, it's been followed by an infodemic. Um, how big this problem is, in your opinion, and also your allowed voice on, on digital platforms and uh, talking about the outbreak, talking about the, re the response and what global, how global health should look like. So do you think digital platforms are actually powerful and helpful tool in, in this uh, outbreak? Yeah, so social media is a double-edged sword. I mean, we've seen it been used quite um, um, negatively in terms of the campaigns against vaccinations, against campaigns against particular people, against particular countries. I mean, there's a sea of misinformation, often coming bizarrely from bots and actually not even real people. And so it becomes hard for, you know, normal people in the sense who are sitting at home who are not health experts, who are, you know, doing their normal lives, COVID comes along, and they're trying to understand what is true and what is not true. Um, and this, I think, again, points to um, the dangers of social media and that you just believe the headlines, because what gets clicked on is often not accurate. You just kind of click on things that seem, you know, interesting or counterintuitive, and, and often they can be wrong. And we've seen that. There's a lot of kind of wrong headlines that have circulated around and wrong information. So this points to the, you could either disengage completely from social media and say, oh, I don't want to do that, or you can do what I think WHO has done effectively, as well as others um, within the health field, and I guess I've attempted a bit as well to say, okay, well, if we have to go onto social media to communicate with people, how can we actually create um, real information and trusted information that's actually robust and serve as, in a sense, as an arbiter of what's true, what's valid, what our concerns are, where state of the, you know, scientific knowledge is, um, actually screening of preprints in terms of there are a lot of preprints, we don't know the quality of all, which one can we point to? So I think it's really important to engage, especially as social media becomes how people get their knowledge. And this is affecting everyone in, 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 in I think, probably every country right now. And so people want information. And I think it's the duty of those working in the space to do their best to provide that information um, in a balanced and in a fair way. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, we received a follow-up question on preparedness. Um, what would happen in the country with no resources? How this, these countries can, can prepare? 
Well, I think here this points to the important role of WHO in actually identifying those gaps. Um, work started after the 2014 Ebola crisis to actually look at countries' core capacities, what we think are the basic building blocks of response to health security, and actually based on those building blocks, think about what are the gaps in terms of financing? And I think usually, you know, the key bilateral donors are, are, are usually stepping in, such as the United States, the UK, France, Germany, Scandinavian countries, Japan. Um, but hopefully, I think what we'll see is a more collective response and actually investment in the world, you know, looking at the world role of the World Bank. I think the World Bank is going to become incredibly important here for thinking how do you channel resources to countries where the gaps are. So WHO helps identify the gaps working with countries, and then the World Bank figures out how do we get, um, you know, um, funds raised to actually fill those. I don't think we can rely just on countries themselves. This is part of the international community and we have to figure out a way to find those resources and we're all seeing that it's much much cheaper to invest in health systems and preparedness than to wait and face what we're seeing now you know probably into the trillions in terms of you know the economic consequences of outbreaks running unchecked. Thank you Debbie. Here's one more question from our viewers. Um, should another outbreak occur what should be the first step to stem the spread? So that's a really tricky one. Where do you exactly you start? I mean, I think the first thing is actually what happened quite early on already here, but seemed to actually kind of diverge in countries is build rapid diagnostic capacity. You have to actually test to know who has the virus and you have to try to contain it. So I think, you know, the first step is actually alerting all countries, figuring out, get your testing up and going, um, make sure that you're having all plans in place to contain the virus and um, and moving from there. Uh, I think it's it's a difficult one with a respiratory pathogen, especially one like this virus, which seems to spread also asymptomatically or pre-symptomatically. So I think we also have to learn that we, you know, we have to learn as we go in the sense that, um, you know, at the start, there were questions around, you know, could asymptomatic transmission be occurring? This would be quite strange given what we've learned from other viruses such as SARS and MERS but that it is occurring, it becomes a challenge. And so if you can't rely on symptoms, then you have to rely actually on testing people to detect who ha who's carrying the virus. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you so much for this great conversation. And before we close, I would like to ask you a last question. Dr. Tadros speaks about solidarity in every of his speeches and appearances. Um, what does this mean for you when this call for solidarity? Well, to me, it means that, you know, this virus is affecting everyone across the world. And actually, what we sh hopefully will be having in the coming weeks and months is, you know, m humankind coming together to find a way to defeat this virus or find a way to control it rather than, you know, get stuck and actually fighting each other. And um, this virus seems to exploit differences um, in, 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 in strategy, um, you know, miscommunication. It, it's going to keep spreading. It doesn't really care about politics. It cares actually, um, you, you know, our, our priority should be actually how do we control it? So I think it's that. I mean, the other thing I think to tie, tie into this is that we do we did start this outbreak saying, you know, everyone is affected the same, all countries the same. And I think what we're going to see is that's not true, that actually it started in East Asia. You know, then we had Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, coming in. Then you had Europe and North America being hit. And the next stage of this outbreak is going to be in low and middle income countries, sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, South Asia, and in these places, um, I think they will be sadly harder hit than other countries because of the, um, you know, in some contexts, you know, this is the lack of healthcare facilities and, and enough equipment and enough resources. And so I think some some countries are, are going to be more affected than others. And we just need to remember that this is a global challenge. And when things come up, such as vaccines or therapeutics, that instead of fighting each other and, you know, powerful states going first, that we try to figure out, you know, some principles around equity and fairness as well. Thank you, Devi. Thank you so much for this great conversation, uh, for sharing your thoughts with us and for being very loud voice for global health and, and this during this pandemic and in general. Um, I would use the opportunity to invite uh, our followers to follow the World Health as virtual first ever virtual World Health Assembly on Monday and Tuesday on our social media channels or at our web website. Also, there are all information um, 
what will be discussed. Um, I would also like to invite you to join our Walk the Talk Healthy at Home event that is taking place today and tomorrow across the world using our social media channels from regional offices and tomorrow from our headquarters channels. So let's have a healthy weekend before we go into the biggest ever uh, World Health Assembly. Thank you everyone for watching and have a good day.